Jessica Jones show between 2015 and 2018. 2018, 2019, I think. Anyway, review. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a show I really loved all three seasons of. This video will have some jokes and I will get into a number of serious topics. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. This video is a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead or so you see me lower my index finger. Please note, I will not be warning before spoilers for earlier entries in the MCU. Anything that happened before season one of this show, I will spoil. If you want my spoilerful thoughts on episodes, there will be a link in the description box to... You know, I, I did a video per season. So... Right, um, this show features and I will be discussing some of the following potentially triggering content. Torture, gaslighting, mental illness, gender identity, drugs, murder, body horror, sexual assault, and rape. Now, I have watched every single episode of this once each and I watched one episode per day in recent months. I did not watch this when it first aired. So, plot. Present day, superpowered PI Jessica Jones runs alias investigations, but when someone from her past reemerges, that becomes her priority. And that is the thing, like, um, before I started watching this, I wondered how much you know they could they could easily do this show like a you know maybe one case per episode or just every so often there'll be a new case this is not hugely driven by a focus on individual cases a lot of the show has her focused on very specific stuff and it's it's frequently some kind of personal, you know, so, so yeah, don't go into the show expecting episode after episode. This is not like NCIS or Law and Order or something with a lot of individual cases that are not personal. Now, let's see the, um... So yeah, um, this is definitely a show that you are meant to binge, but you can just watch, you know, I could see myself, uh, you know, sitting down watching an entire season in, you know, one day, one sitting maybe even. But it works well if you're just watching, you know, I, I watched one episode per, there were a couple of days where I watched two episodes, but never more than two in one day. Now, so the writing, so this was created by Melissa Rosenberg, and let's see, yeah, I have to say, I don't really know the people in the writer's room. Um, let's see. So, yeah, there are occasionally some convenient writing on the show, and it's frustrating because it could easily have been fixed. Like, I, I think most of the time this is very carefully written and it feels very refined. Like, they didn't leave something in just because. But there are a couple of times over the course of the show where you can pinpoint something and it's just, ah, I wish they had just gone over that a little bit more and figured out a way that wasn't so convenient. Let's see, and... Yeah, uh, the writing has a tremendous amount of emotional intelligence and it explores 
grief and they try to avoid letting anyone just be disposable. They don't always succeed, but you can tell they are trying. And they very frequently do succeed. Not only is the prote uh, right. critic, quote, not only is the protagonist a woman, there are multiple major characters that are women. All of them are allowed flaws. None of them are these perfect idealized characters. It is a show where women aren't punished for being human beings. Issues that are unique to women are not only brought up, they are explored in great depth and with a lot of sympathy and empathy. And, right, one critic said the first season feels claustrophobic because of the trauma it deals with. I agree that it does. I think that's a good thing. And I don't, you know, the, the critic I'm quoting realizes that it was on purpose, but he thinks that it's limiting. It, it means that a number of people are not going to make it through the entire season and thus not be, you know, keep watching the show, maybe even jump off Marvel Netflix in general. I think it was necessary, it was the right choice to make it so claustrophobic. The show handles plot twists quite well. And yeah, so the... I guess I will talk about all three season openers without spoilers. Um, they do a really great job setting things up that, you know, you want to know more about and... You know, if something is set up in the season opener, maybe it's going to change over the course of the season. And each time I found that satisfying. And, yeah, you know, by the end of the, the pilot, I would definitely say you have a good sense of what the, the rest of the season is going to be and be about. And I, yeah, so to briefly talk about all three season finales, again, no spoilers, they do a good job wrapping up their individual seasons, and you feel like things mattered. And something I really appreciate, having watched a lot of TV shows over, you know, my lifetime, each of the seasons here ends in a way where you can stop watching at that point. Like, you don't have to... They're, they don't have cliffhangers. They don't... You know, they're, they're set up for the future, sure. But they didn't... And, and they also... When they were doing the finale for season three, they knew that they weren't going to get a season four. And because of this, they did... Um, what's the word? They changed some things in the in the finale to make it more satisfying of a of closure, and yeah, they do a really great job. Now, let's see. I honestly don't know that. I I don't think I've read any Jessica Jones um, in in the comics. I do understand that. She was a hero for a while, and I've heard some say she didn't really stand out. She wasn't that interesting, necessarily. And then, I want to say it was Brian Michael Bendis who came in and said, I know how to make this character interesting, and he did some things with the character that have really... that, that made her much more complex and interesting. This show kind of starts after... The, the um, hero thing, you know, wouldn't be Mar Marvel Netflix without a reluctant hero. But the, the um, yeah, they, they take some elements from the Brian Michael Bendis run. And, you know, some of it is like literally they recreate certain frames, certain panels. Um, other things they change so they fit into the MCU. And, yeah, I've... I've been very happy with how they did the... Yeah, again, you know, I can't compare it too much to the comics, but I think they did a really great job. This feels like it belongs in the MCU, but also it's, you know, like the rest of Marvel Netflix, it's much more mature and complex. Now, I don't really recognize the various directors used either although actually yeah one episode was directed by Kristen Ritter who also plays Jessica Jones and she does really good job in general the direction on this is is great 
So this show is feminist in the vein of Birds of Prey more than the Wonder Woman solo movies. The women are messy, they sometimes make mistakes, but some, many of them, are trying to do good. It doesn't mean that they're lost causes. And some of them don't try to do good. It's complex is what I'm saying. The show creates a world with a number of damaged people trying to get by, even more so than the rest of Marvel Netflix. And the show incorporates the superpowers into the noir field. Like, we've seen, seen many PIs in stories break into people's places. Well, Jessica doesn't need to use a credit card to Jimmy open a door. She just uses her super strength to break the lock, pushing the door open. And, yeah, the noir style is amazing from right away. Like, the intro sequence goes really deep into it. But, you know, beyond that, you have narration, shadows, silhouettes, you know jazz music and yeah plot twists conspiracy um detective work and you know some jessica spends a lot of time looking at people through their windows and i guess the idea is supposed to be that it's so humid in new york that nobody ever draws their shades but sure whatever and you know, in, in an early episode, there is some, you know, Jessica is judging someone for their, their weight and someone else for a kink. And at first I got the, the sense that maybe, you know, the, the show is shaming those people. But really, I think it's saying that Jessica has become very cynical and judgmental from looking at people so much. She prefers prefers to, if she's going to look at someone, she prefers it be through the viewfinder of her camera. She does not like getting close to people. And, yeah, this is the Marvel Netflix show I where I care the most about the, the plot and characters. And... We aren't told immediately why Jessica is in the situation she's in, but it is revealed. And... Let's see. <clears throat> uh, yeah, there was one, at least, yeah, there are multiple developments over the course of the show that just hit like a kick to the gut. And I like that the on the show, sex is treated as just another aspect of adult life. It's not necessarily meaningless, but it's not what everything in the universe centers around. The adult characters on the show have sex, but they also work for a living, eat, talk to people. The se sex shows how characters are feeling and how relationships are developing. Now, uh, one or more female characters on the show do have casual sex, which did, of course, lead to some user reviews trying to shame them because they're women. If they were men, they'd be impressed, but how dare a woman try to take control of her sex life, especially if she isn't in a committed relationship. And actually, you know, the person didn't call the male ones heroes, but there are also male characters on this show that engage in casual sex, and I don't think I encountered any reviews that criticized them for it. And... Yeah, the, the show explores abortion, extremely relevant, you know, since the episode aired, the right wing were successful in their decades-long campaign to make abortion as close as possible to entirely legal in the US, and when it aired, it was clear that they wouldn't stop until they got that. And, yeah, Jessica has seen making amends, not unlike a recovering alcoholic, and... You know, this is in response to trauma and very natural. Not that you should feel bad if you don't react like that. Everybody processes differently. Now, uh, let's see. Um, right, there's at least one scene where a woman dominates a man sexually, probably working through fear based on the specific scene and let's see yeah uh the show respects consent and communicates that very clearly and 
um, yeah, there's a character who is, yeah, who, who rapes a, you know, what, one of the men on the show rapes one of the women on the show, and the show has the scene where they meet, and we see that she's wearing normal clothes, not anything remotely sexual, since otherwise a bunch of misogynists would use that, making the absurd claim that she was asking for it. You know, not that this, this show wouldn't make that false, uh, you know, um, wouldn't support that statement anyway, but... Yeah, it, it, you know, too many people just do not acknowledge that that frequently even making that claim isn't backed up by what they were wearing. And... Yeah, the show brings up suicide, death, and killing a lot, so I appreciate it's never throwaway. And, yeah, most... You know, a, a lot of the times, if a person dies on the show, it means something. It changes the people who survive them, those kinds of things. And, yeah, we will know who they were, what type of person they were. And while we didn't always know them, we feel empathy for them. We feel something. And, let's see... Yeah, uh, some themes that the show explores are male fragility, how fast women can lose their power, especially to other women with power, because it is so difficult for women to attain power. So instead of powerful women standing together, you end up with a lot of them trying to take each other's power. And it's a show where a number of characters get triggered, and in general the show doesn't use triggering as a punchline, but treats it with respect, as it should. And... Some of the show explores how badly women are treated by the legal system. There are a lot of misogynists who think they get a free pass, which is absurd. And... Yeah, another theme they explore is that violence might feel cathartic, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. In real life, there are very few situations that violence can actually solve beyond the very immediate situation. You have to go for the root or it'll just happen again. If you have a show where the first season is very focused, it can be really effective if the second season, or at least one of the follow-up seasons, really goes and toys with what is set up in the first season. Maybe characters that have a lot of power lose that power, or vice versa. A major character loses something that used to define them, has to come up with a new identity. So, a short list of shows that do this, not all of them in season two, Prison Break, Dexter, Alias, various Star Trek shows, Burn Notice, and the... Uh, hold on. There we go. Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and The Punisher. All Marvel Netflix shows that have more than one season. Not Defenders, since they only have the one season. And... Yeah, another theme. Not everyone who wants to save the world can maintain a healthy perspective, keep themselves from going too far. And... Let's see. Right, so, critic quote. Plural. Jessica Jones is a good series that, in its setting and its treatment, it is closer to film noir than to the stories of superheroes. Very true. Shadows of people of blind, silhouettes of people, a cynical, seen-it-all PI protagonist who provides narration, sax music. And let's see. Yeah, some people felt that there was too much about Kilgrave and... There's certainly a distinct focus on them for, for some of the show, but I thought that was great. And let's see. Yeah, so the, the entire... Yes, all of season two was directed entirely by women. Right from the start, this puts the nail in the coffin that there are not enough good female directors out there for people to hire. It was a lazy excuse, and Jessica Jones showed how lazy it really is. As well as this, it was interesting to see how different spins on classical framing, classic framing can be achieved when it is not the same person doing it each time. And yeah, the, the show uses psychological trauma and torment that dips into horror territory. Very true. And that brings us to the character. So, Kristen Ritter plays Jessica Jones. I've seen a few 
interviews with her out of character and just watched this video about her entire career. And apparently in real life, you know, yeah, certainly based on these these interviews and, and such. Apparently, in real life, she has a bubbly personality, and it is like she completely disappears into Jessica Jones when she's playing this character. It is very impressive. Like, when I first saw... the, the I, I barely knew anything about her. I, I just I haven't watched the thing she's in. Um, but honestly, now I really might. You know, f just to see more of, of her acting... When I started watching this, I kind of assumed maybe she really is kind of, you know, she's she's got dark hair, she's, yeah, she looks like she would be, she would have the, the personality of Jessica Jones, but no, it's completely different. Uh, you know, you if you're seeing Kristen Ritter and you're not sure if she's playing Jessica, if it's like footage of her playing Jessica Jones or if it's an interview... If she's smiling, it's probably an interview, because Jessica Jones is not a very happy person, and just, yeah, it's it's deeply impressive how well she just, she's incredibly convincing. She is a former superhero with superhuman strength, limited flight suffering from PTSD, who runs her own detective agency, Alias Investigations. And let's see. A showrunner Melissa Rosenberg had Rear on the top of her list for playing Jones, even when Rosenberg was developing the series for ABC rather than Netflix. Marvel Television head Jeff Loeb noted that the character has real problems with a number of things that she abuses, and we're not shying away from that. Rear described the character as very rough around the edges, dry and sarcastic, and a total asshole sometimes. But I think at her core, she's a good person. She put on 10 pounds, or 4 pi, 4 and a half kilograms, for people counting in, you know, real thing, of muscle for the role, and Elizabeth Cappuccino portrayed a young Jessica. Now, I have seen some people say that Jessica Jones is unlikable. You know, Jessica Jones, the traumatized rape survivor who has PTSD. If you can't empathize with someone like that, I implore you, work on that part of yourself. People like that exist in the real world. They deserve our empathy. Also, why are so many female leads called unlikable for traits and actions that male leads are called complex for? Breaking Bad, Sopranos, Game of Thrones, Dexter, Mad Men, and probably others I don't know all about um, have male leads like that. And actually... This show does, you know, with Jessica and some of the other major female characters, yeah, this allows these female characters to be complex. You know, if they if there's something they do or say that's bad, it's not made out to be that they're just, you know, there's there's this misogynist trope where women are manipulative and like selfish and just want to take and just want to hurt men you know it's it's a notion you could you could only believe this if you just had no empathy for women at all of course women don't want to hurt men just like universally but a lot of men aren't willing to admit the things they do to that hurt women so yeah I'm not saying that every time someone hurts you, it's because you did something to bring that on yourself. But the idea that women are, are just, as a gender, inherently more manipulative and harmful and cruel than men is just absurd. Let's see, and... Oh, right. We're seeing... Or early on, we see that when she's recovering from her PTSD being triggered, she repeats a list of streets in her hometown. I love her cynicism, which she would call realism. And, yeah, you know, early on we see she can't sleep, so she goes out to get some work done. I love that part of her process is filling a thermos with, like, vodka. It's certainly not beer. It's a harder alcohol than that. And she probably frequently feels, you know, if something's good, it's too good to be true. And 
the yeah uh, she has PTSD nightmares where you know she'll she'll suddenly just fall asleep maybe even in, like in yeah an early scene has her waking up from having fallen asleep on the subway train you know which like if you've ever been on a subway like they're noisy there's probably at least one person around that you look at and you're like I really don't want to be I want to I want to be completely alert in case that person tries something you know a lot of them smell bad especially in America and the yeah you know she still manages to fall asleep there and when she does she has a PTSD nightmare PTSD flashback you know it's yeah you it's very clear she has untreated PTSD and it's treated as something real it's it's yeah and she also early on says I'm not safe anywhere I can't trust anyone very common for people with trauma PTSD and rape survivors to feel and let's see yeah and and you know when she has this PTSD flashback on the train she she elbows the window because she thinks there's someone right next the the person who victimized her is right next to her and you know it ends up with everyone on the train staring at her very accurate and sympathetic depiction of PTSD and let's see And, right, this has, it's a show that features women who are confident about sex, which is great, very healthy. And it, the, the show tackles how important public perception is when it comes to trials. And it's a show that acknowledges how ethnically diverse New York really is. It's always so ridiculous when you watch, like, white men's idea of what New York looks like, and there's just everyone is white and it's like have you ever been to new like i spent like 30 minutes in new york once i was headed to a different part of america and like i'll grant that obviously not every part of new york is equally ethnically diverse but like yeah huge amount of ethnic diversity in just that half hour like and let's see and, yeah, it also, you know, it features people um, try to make amends if, they've, if they're responsible for doing something really bad. And, yeah, we, we see examples on the show of Jessica's id, her repressed thoughts and desires, coming to the surface of her conscious thought when she rests or dozes off. That by itself is not unhealthy. But the problem is they're spoken to her, not in her own voice, but in the person who victimized her. He still has that much power over her, even though he hasn't spoken directly to her in a long time. Let's see. And that's how he exerts his power. And yeah, sadly, accurate for many people who've been traumatized to them, it can feel like no time has passed since the last contact with the person, since the last time that person traumatized them. It feels like they're still right there causing pain. And the show also acknowledges that stalkers make you paranoid. And... Jessica tries not to get close to people, but every so often, if she... No, you know, if she looks at a situation and she's like, oh, wow, I've been that person. I've been exactly there. She tries to help. And the, let's see, there's a support group for people who've been traumatized that, where they try to, to recover together. And... Shared trauma can create strong bonds between people fast like nothing else. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, in, in Flashback, it's revealed why Jessica runs a detective agency rather than going out and being a hero. Let's see. 
you know, with super strength and, you know, limited flight, I think it's more that she jumps really high and then can land and, and keep running and, and start running right after. Uh, even if she, you know, it seems like, oh, wow, that was way too steep a drop to, you know. Yeah, she could be doing the hero thing, but she's chosen to be a private eye instead. And, yeah, I, I'm really glad that from the moment we see her, she is a private eye. We get flashbacks that explain, but to the viewer, it's cemented that she she can't be a hero, she feels. And, honestly, she drinks so much, every episode is a bottle episode. And, yeah, there's a, yeah, in interview she sounds completely different. Like, she has this higher-pitched voice that Jessica will sometimes put on to trick people into thinking less of her. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know if, like, one of the directors straight up said, so, you know how you are in interview, talk like that so that they'll think less, but, yeah. Let's see, you know, th thankfully, in real life, she has so thoroughly proven that she can act that people don't underestimate her as an actress. Right, uh, I did see one person say, one user review say, she has one facial expression all the time, like so many other of today's young actors. Yeah, because she's talented enough that she doesn't need to change that much about her face. It's the tiniest little changes that speak volumes. The idea that an actor has to completely change their facial expression a lot to express emotion is hugely outdated. You know, she's a character who doesn't like... She, does, she doesn't wear her heart on her sleeve, so she tries to not re show much emotion in her face. And that makes it much more... Ah, what's the... Yeah... Um, hit much harder when she does. Now, Mike Coulter plays Luke Cage, a man with superhuman strength and unbreakable skin, whom, uh, let's see, yeah, whom Jones encounters. He put on 30 pounds, or 14 kilos, of muscles for, kilograms, of muscle for the role, and described the character as a darker, grittier, more tangible character than Iron Man and Thor. He likes to keep things close to his chest, operate on the hush-hush. Coulter was pleased and surprised that the audience got the character, as Luke was a man of few words and a lot of subtext, which was refreshing. We were going for this character in a way that said little, but spoke volumes, and I felt people got the subtleties. And, yeah, very, very much so. He, he does a really, really great job, and the portrayal of him goes a long way to combat this ridiculous racist stereotype there is that black men are inherently more dangerous than, you know, white people. Now, Rachel Taylor plays Patricia Trish Walker. She used to be known as Patsy, and now she prefers to go by Trish. She tries to distance herself from the you know she was a former mo she is a former model and child star known as Patsy she's Jessica Jones adoptive sister best friend who now works as a radio host Jones best friend was going to be Carol Danvers when Rosenberg was developing the series at ABC was changed to Walker due to the changing nature of the MCU and the fact that Danvers would be featured in her own film which I yeah it makes a lot of sense I gotta say, I'm I'm glad that it was it was Trish. I I really do like the, the character of Carol Danvers a lot, and I think she, you know, I think Brie Larson does a really great job with the character. Uh, let's see, you know, she was she was dealt a somewhat bad hand with some of the writing in her solo movie, but since then she's done really really great. Let's see. Rosenberg ultimately found this to be much more appropriate. It was better that Jessica's best friend was not someone with powers. It actually ends up being a really great mirror for her. And Loeb said, What's most important is the relationship between Walker and Jessica, how these two women who are sisters could be that different and yet believe in the same kinds of things. And... Let's see... Right, and Catherine Blades portrays portrayed a young Trish. And... It actually, like, every so often we'll get a glimpse, uh, visual or audible, audio-based, 
of her days on the the she she had this sitcom i believe it was called it's patsy which she was on some of her childhood some of her teenage years and like we'll hear the theme song or we'll hear a few lines from it or someone will describe a plot line from some of it you know and it's it's really really they they absolutely hit the nail on the head like the the writers must have watched a lot like you really get the sense okay this is yeah this would have been on the disney channel and oh there's a lesson to learn and like all these just yeah is is yeah, they do a really, really great job on that. And actually, for a while uh, on the on the show, like when a new person recognizes her, you know, they recognize her as as Patsy. Like she still she struggles to get completely away from that, even though she has spent years doing exactly that. Like she hasn't, she doesn't act anymore. She doesn't model anymore. She's a radio personality who talks about fairly serious issues. Will Traval as Will Simpson, a NYPD sergeant, very serious about his job. Let's see. And um Yeah. Um in the in the comics he's very different and they they basically had to reinvent him. Um yeah, it was just it, they they couldn't really work with what they ha what was there on the page, so they had to reinvent him. I think they did a really great job. I I know a little bit about him in the comics, and just wow, they really yeah they had to change. They did change, and they get some really interesting stuff out of him. Aaron Moriarty plays Hope Schlotman, a student athlete attending New York University, a client of Alias Investigations, and. Let's see. Yeah, uh, Moriarty called her character a polar opposite to Jessica Jones, describing Hope as an all-American girl, innocent and really earnest. And Eka Darville plays Malcolm Ducasse, Jones' neighbor who struggles with drug addiction, resulting in... Let's see... Right, uh, Darville stated Malcolm was a new character for the series, though inspired by seed characters from the comics. He also felt playing the character of the drug addiction was pretty intense and dark. And, yeah, Malcolm's relationship with Jessica is more sibling-like than anything else. I just have to very briefly mention, Eka Darville and Rachel Taylor are both British, and I had no idea watching this show. It's only because I saw some ba behind-the-scenes stuff here on YouTube, and they speak in their original accent, and I just, like, it... I would never have guessed in a million years that they were not American. They sound completely convincing in the... Yeah. And Carrie Ann Moss plays... Jerry Hogarth, an attorney, potentially powerful ally to Jones. She hires Jones for cases. Now, the character's gender was changed from male to female for the series, and the character was made a lesbian. And Moss signed on to the series after reading the first two scripts, having been pitched the character by Loeb and Rosenberg. Moss described the character as fierce, strong, and powerful, and she likes that power. She worked a few days every episode, which allowed her to grow the character throughout the series while not knowing what the character would become as she played each moment, which she noted was how real life is. If you only know Carrie Ann Moss as Trinity from The Matrix, like, don't, you know, obviously she does great work there as well. She's very intense and there are some really great character moments but this she is it, it, it her performance in this is on a whole nother level and and part of it is that the character is much more complex you know the the character of trinity is fairly straightforwardly like you know especially in the first movie but here like holy crap she is absolutely incredible like i i was spellbound whenever she was on screen just yeah um she's a very very harsh character but she is uh, th there is an explanation for it we get an explanation for why she is the way she is and the show isn't saying that it's good 
that she is this very harsh character. And the fact that she's lesbian allows them to explore, you know, this has much more complex... And I realize that's, you know, th this is not the only relatively recent show to have more complex lesbian relationships. I realize that's, you know, th there are other shows that also do that. Uh, m many of them predate this. But they made the active choice to gender swap a character, you know, for some more diversity, thankfully. And I really, I'm, I'm very glad that they made that choice. Um, and yeah, you know, people like Jerry Hogarth exist in the real world. So let's explore what, you know, what makes a person like that and what the, the uh, what's the word? What, what makes a person like that and how do they respond to different situations? Now, David Tennant plays Kilgrave, and I gotta say, um, I never have watched Doctor Who, but if I do, it's gonna be very difficult for me to unsee. Like, ev evidently, actors who are drawn to the role of Doctor Who are also drawn to playing monsters in other, you know, yeah, in, in stuff that isn't Doctor Who. So, yeah, um... I, I probably never will watch Doctor Who. It just doesn't really seem like my kind of thing. Uh, no, no disrespect to people who do love it. But if I do, it's going to be very difficult for me to see David Tennant... What's his name? Matt Smith. And... Um, I'll real quick find the last one. Uh, right around here. Oh, okay. Let's expand. Peter Capaldi. Now, so Kilgrave is a man from Jones' past who can control minds. Let's see. Loeb called him a terrible man who doesn't see himself as terrible. And, yeah, compared him to Vincent D'Onofrio's Wilson Fisk in Daredevil, saying there are going to be times when you're uncomfortable because you're not quite rooting for Matt, you're kind of rooting for Wilson, and it's the same kind of thing you're going to find in Jessica. There's going to be moments where some of the things that she does is pretty questionable, and some of the things that when you learn about Kilgrave's character and the way that David Tennant plays that character... It's really extraordinary. And James Friedson Jackson portrayed a young Kilgrave. You can't roll how he rolls. He possesses your soul. Now, I've made at least one reference to Crazy Town, The Gift of Game, in every single video I've done on the Marvel Netflix shows. At first, it wasn't the plan, but they came so naturally for the first couple of videos, so I decided to make sure they would be completely consistent. If you've never listened to it, it is one of the funniest unintentional comedy albums of all time. It's so try-hard. It's hilarious. If you don't want to listen to the entire album, I do recommend the One Hit Wonderland video that Todd and the Shadows did on them and the masterpiece of cheese that is Butterfly. Let's see. And yeah, a Kilgrave gaslighted Jessica. He controlled her completely. He took away her ability to withhold consent. In the real world, there are no men with powers quite like his, but there are many men who do the things that he does, with emotional manipulation, pressure, threats, and the like, so it is an extremely relevant story to tell. Excellent fellow YouTuber, The Cavernacle, every so often does video talking about toxic masculinity and these men who basically think that they should be allowed to, that, that women's consent shouldn't matter to them, and that a real man doesn't care if the woman wants it. So, yeah. One of the things that is so repulsive about Kilgrave as a villain is that he is completely obsessed with Jessica and willing to act on that, and that is one of the scariest things to a woman today. Basically, Kilgrave is a narcissist who hurts the people he has power over to satisfy his own urges. He's basically what Trump was before he ran for office and countless other men, so extremely relevant depiction of evil. To be clear, no one is born evil. There are evil deeds, evil choices. J.R. Ramirez plays Oscar Arocho, a painter 
in Jones Building and let's see Terry Chen plays Price Cheng a, a also a private investigator and yeah also interesting character and I gotta admit when I first met him I you know when when he first appears on the show I thought oh wow this is just an asshole there's nothing redeemable about him and over the course of the show, they managed to add more. Leia Gibson plays Inez Green. And I really can't give anything away about her character, but I just want to say she does an incredible job. She was 100% convincing every step of the way. Janet McTeer plays an important character. And I... Yeah, she is, she is one of the best on, on this show. Just such a compelling character. And, uh, let's see. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could talk more, but just, she does incredible acting. Her character's in very interesting. And Benjamin Walker is... Yeah, I shouldn't say either, but again... Compelling character, great actor. Sarita Chowdhury plays Kith Leone, a concert cellist who has a relationship with someone on the show. Uh, okay, I don't want to give away exactly what... I, I just want to say Jeremy Bob appears on this and does an absolutely amazing job. He's, he's incredibly... He does exactly what he needs to. Tiffany Mack plays Zaya Acano, and yeah, uh, the, she, the way she plays the character, the, the way the character is written and performed, really helps to fight back against this absurd stereotype that black women are somehow less womanly and less like, yeah, you know, during slavery in America, uh, you know, they some of the slave owners deemed it necessary to dehumanize black women uh, you know even if you can convince there's, there's a lot of white men if you tell them okay that man who doesn't look like you he's dangerous and a lot of white men are gonna be like okay i guess you know dangerous but western culture does engender this idea that we men should protect women so you know what about the female slaves and yeah they would basically you know if, if you look at for example one of the more recent examples was during the obama presidency where like a lot of political cartoonists and just they would they would depict michelle obama as if she were a a trans woman basically which, you know, to them is, is awful in real life. Like, trans women deserve tr trans, ri trans rights. Trans rights are human rights. But, yeah, you know, yeah, Tiffany Mack, Isaiah Okonjo does a really great job fighting back against that. I really appreciate that. And Rebecca De Mornay portrays Dorothy Walker, uh, the mother of Trish and adoptive mother of Jessica Jones. I'm really glad that Rebecca de Mornay is still acting. She's still incredibly talented. And just, yeah, it's one of my favorite characters of her. Um, you know, honestly, uh, overall, uh, her... Uh, okay, now I'm a little unsure. I, I just gotta double check that I have the the name right of the character. Yes, uh, Peyton Flanders is probably still my favorite Rebecca de Mornay character, but Dorothy Walker is a very close second, and certainly a more complex character, and one that, like, just, yeah, Rebecca de Mornay when she's when she really gets into a character like you just there's nothing she's she's so much fun just yeah uh throws herself into characters and i really appreciate how complex dorothy walker gets to be 
like the 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 show makes clear from very early on some of the time she was abusive towards Trish and the show never tries to you know I I um I suppose it's a spoiler to say exactly what but I I haven't watched the movie myself but there's a movie years ago uh not not like many years may uh actually yeah I I know what the title is I won't say it out loud but I'll really quickly so it was called Holy crap, really? Okay, that was longer than I thought. Anyway, um, it's less than 10 years. Let's go with that. And there's a character in that that says, yeah, yeah, um, you know, he's t talking to a, a woman, says, yeah, your mom was abusive of you. And then apparently goes on to blame the woman for an abusive parent, like, it's just, yeah, there really needs to be a proper, like, that's such an offensive thing to say, um, yeah, the, the, um, yeah, this show does not make it out that, oh, you know, the, the, the it was, it was the abuse victim's own fault, abuse survivor's own fault that they were abused no 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 it does explain why she was abusive but it never um it's not doing apologism it's not saying no no no. it was it was fine because it wasn't no no, no. she did it you know some of it we even see some you know some of it is is referred to but some of it we actually see with our own eyes but the character does also you know, she she thinks that what she's doing is gonna help. Um, yeah, you know, parents are complex. This is a show where a lot of women make decisions that cause harm, but it's not judging them, it explores why they do it. And a lot of the time, it hurts other women more than men, challenging the misogynist stereotype that women just hurt men. Let's see. Yeah, um... I'm of the opinion that when women hurt men, it tends to be because of patriarchy rather than the women, you know, having the chance, you know, when, when rich people hurt people, that's because the, there's nothing, you know, that they, they don't, a lot of them don't learn empathy, but when women hurt especially when they hurt men, it tends to be because of patriarchy. And, you know, when, when I was a child, I didn't realize that. But that is something that when you come to, you know, if you, if you listen to enough female feminists, you come to realize it really, you know, when, yeah, as an example, when, when women take advantage of power they have or manipulate and such, it tends to be because they're worried that they'll lose everything if them if their male straight partner loses interest in them and countless women throughout history have you know been been hurt greatly by men who didn't care enough to you know uh, yeah so let's see yeah uh that brings us to the dialogue there are times where, like, they just have to get exposition across, but they tend to do a really great job making it sound natural, like people in this talk the way people do in real life. And let's see, yeah, all eight entries in the IMDb quote section are good. There's some incredibly snarky people on the show, and this is a show that understands that, you know, it's important that characters speak differently. They, all of them have their own voice and vocabulary, and you can tell who is saying that. Like, if you read a line of dialogue that's... Yeah, I would, I would say if you've watched some of the show, but not all of it, and you read a line of dialogue, not knowing what character is saying it, if it's a character you've already met, there's a really strong chance you can tell which character it is. Now, the cinematography was handled by Manuel Bellater and Petr 
Linomath. And let's see. Uh, right, so one critic said of season one, the show is often shot in a flat, predictable manner, which is likely a choice made to place empathy emphasis on the deep emotion of the piece instead of a perceived comic book look but it results in a show that has almost no visual language at all luckily it's never dull in every other department from rudder's totally engaged performance the character could have been pure snark but she never gives in to that impulse to the aforementioned themes that rosenberg so captivate captivatingly weaves into her narrative marvel's jessica jones works and yeah um there, every so often, they'll go for something daring, uh, something very noir-ish. And, uh, you know, yeah, I've mentioned they will recreate exact panels uh, from the page on the screen. But, yeah, a lot of the time it is flat and predictable. Um, that is that is true. The, the, um, the cinematography is not its greatest suit. Though I will say this is a show where when people are... Like, it's not a very action-heavy show, but it tends to let us see the action. When, you know, a lot of media from this time is, you know, like there's this idea that it's more exciting if you can't really make it out and you're just caught up in the chaos of it. And this is a show that disagrees. And for sure, sometimes it can work really well, but it was the right choice for this show. Uh, right, so I don't really know any of the editors, but this is a very well-edited show. It uses flashbacks to great effect, but also there, there are a lot of times where something will be described rather than shown. Some of the time it's because of budget. You know, the, the Marvel Netflix shows do what they can to, to cut costs. There's... I forget if it's this show, but one of these has a character break some glass in order to to get into a a locked room. You know, break, break some glass in the in the door, and we just hear the glass being broken, and then the camera pans over and shows the door and the care and we see the character put her put the hand through the glass and you know open the door. And if you, you know, it's because it's easier than having to set up for the breakable each time. If they can just have it with the bro, you know, also note, we don't see the door before that, at least not from that angle. So if there, you know, the other door might be in a different location, you know, and yeah, that means they don't have to ready the breakable each time. But yeah, uh, really, really impactful editing and yeah it's not a very special effects heavy show but the ones that there are are very convincing and it's extremely rare for this show to have like distracting effects there's some really solid stunt work and you know the, the this is street level like the other marvel shows and, yeah, this was actually filmed in New York City. And gets a lot out of using the, um, yeah, these actual locations. And it shows some very different parts of New York. Uh, Jerry's offices and apartment are very high class, very expensive you know, Jessica's and others are much lower, yeah. So, the action on this show includes chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, use of superpowers, let's see, and, yeah, um, it's really less of an action show, more of a thriller with some action scenes and I think that was the right choice um you know at the end of the day like if you just really want a a show that's about action you know Daredevil 
is, is the Marvel Netflix show, you know, now they're on Disney Plus, that's the one to go with. Um, and there's definitely, old, uh, right, Daredevil, if you want the kind of hand-to-hand -hand vigilante thing, Punisher, if guns are more your thing, you know, um, yeah. So, so the, it's not that there was some, you know, and, and by the time the first season of this premiered on Netflix, the first season of Daredevil had already premiered. So, you know, they, they knew that they had the freedom to, they don't have to make the, 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 the this show, this show doesn't have to be built around action because if people want action you know they have daredevil this is trying to do something different and you know i, I quoted a, a critic as saying you know psychological horror in in parts of the show that makes a lot more sense it, it's very difficult to you you can't action horror can work but action and psychological horror, that's difficult because, at the, you know, you, you can have something be scary. You know, the Blade movies are action horror movies. You can have something be scary, but also have someone kicking ass. But psychological horror, you really, that's difficult to have if someone's also running around kicking a lot of ass. So, yeah, you know, yeah, Jessica Jones can beat up people, but... You know, you can't beat up PTSD. You can't beat up trauma. So, the you know, it actually, it takes this character, you know, one of the first things we see her do is, like, throw a guy. You know, so it's, we, we know from the start she is strong. She can, you know, if you come directly at her, you better have a lot of force behind you or you're going to lose. You know, but... That's not what this is about. It's not, you know, it, and, and that's also a thing, like, it's, you know, today, even women who feel like they do a lot to protect themselves, to be strong, you know, they still end up being attacked. Let's see. And... Yeah, you know, um, yeah, by now it's been months, but I remember hearing the story about um, there was a guy who was in therapy. And, you know, therapy can really trigger anxiety um, because the brain basically, the lizard brain doesn't really understand. It, it just considers it an attack. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was triggering and... Yeah, he ended up attacking her, uh, killing her. He waited outside of where she lived until she left, and then he attacked her. You know, he, he couldn't have done it... You know, if, if he had attacked her during a session, there would have been security. If he had tried to get into the apartment, I'm sure there were locks that would have slowed him down enough that she could at least call the cops, and that would hopefully scare him off. But no, he just... Like a predator, he waited for the for a moment when she couldn't, you know, when when there wasn't anyone who could protect her, there wasn't any lock that could protect her, and he killed her. And yeah, I I think make taking a character like Jessica Jones, and giving her psychological trauma and saying she she is still afraid, you know that, you know I again. I'm a I'm a cis man. I've never been a woman, trans or cis, so I can't speak to it myself. But I understand from listening to a lot of female feminists that, yeah, a lot of women today do feel like even if they do a lot to protect themselves, it's, you know, they're never going to be able to do quite enough. There's always going to be some threat. And that's, yeah, I really appreciate a show actually acknowledging that. And, and exploring that. So, the music was composed by Sean Callery, who has 34 credits as composer for TV. Let's see. Um, nine for video, 
three movies, three shorts, two video games, and one documentary. And yeah, he does a really great job. Like, the music really feels... Like, if I listen to this music, you know, without context, without really knowing what it was... Yeah, you know, I would... The, the noir aspect comes across very strongly. Now, that brings us to the pacing. So, for Marvel Netflix, you know, Netflix required them to produce... 13 episodes per season. There are only two exceptions for all of Marvel Netflix. Defenders only has eight episodes, and Iron Fist Season 2 only has ten. Both of those are better paced than... Yeah, any of the 13 episode seasons. I think the idea was they wanted people to binge all 13 episodes, which, if you do it in a single sitting, you know, it's like one day. So you can knock that out in a weekend and still have time for other things. And maybe it would have been fine if they decided to do arcs where the first six episodes are one story, then the last seven are another. But as it is, the pacing has issues. They don't have enough story for... 13 episodes and it's not that you can't do that kind of thing with that many episodes because there's better pacing in every season of prison break most of which were longer a few of which were shorter or the same length same thing for the two seasons of terminator the sarah connor chronicles it's been too long since i watched dexter to be able to compare and contrast with that one but from what i recall that one also had better pacing and certainly that one there, there was, um, another thing is that some episodes might feel like nothing was really accomplished over the course of the episode. It's not as big a problem here as in, in some of the others, but, yeah. Heck, the one season of Blade, the TV series, had better pacing. In these cases, that's because they had enough story for the amount of episodes, and each episode had enough story and character and action, which is also something the Netflix Marvel shows struggle with. Some episodes really don't have enough of those things. I'll grant that something like Alias, the the um, Sidney Bristow, not Jessica Jones, Alias, doesn't necessarily have better pacing, but that was more of an issue with network interference than season length. Season length. Um... Yeah, uh, I don't know that I would say that any episode of this show is filler, but there are episodes where, like, the way the episode starts and the way the episode ends, it's like, you really didn't need this entire episode. Like, the, the stuff that was in this episode could have been in other episodes, and you just, like, yeah. You know, I, I get, like, if you're, if you're binging all 13 episodes, because... Yeah, if you if you aren't familiar with Netflix, they um, I don't know if they still do it, but for these they would premiere an entire season in the same day. So if people watch an episode and really want to see what the next one is, as long as it's still the same season, they can, you know. And yeah, if you're if you're binging anyway, then a filler episode or something that resembles a filler episode might not bother you that much, but. Yeah, if you if you choose to watch one at a time, then a filler episode that might be where you decide, okay, maybe maybe I have other shows that I would rather be watching because I can't watch all of them. Now, uh episodes they they tend to be at least 40 minutes. Some of them are around so some of them are in the the 50s. And, um, yeah, for each of the seasons, I would say watch at least the first episode, the season opener. And if by the end of the season opener you just do not care about what happens next, yeah, the season might not be for you. Or if it's the first season, the show might not be for you. So, let's see. That brings us to the... Yeah, the best element of this show is definitely the exploration of trauma. 
the exact exploration and the exact kind of trauma varies, but the show does consistently explore trauma. I really appreciate it never just drops that element. It would become a completely different show if it did. The worst aspect is the, you know, like with all Marvel Netflix shows other than The Defenders, there's at least one season that has 13 episodes and it it hurts the, the pacing. Um, right, yeah. One critic said, the, the worst thing according to others, one critic said of season two, Though this season of Jessica Jones was directed entirely by women, it continues a harmful trend of resting its feminist terrorism on the backs of people of color, and perhaps that is Jessica Jones' greatest downfall. I hate to say it, but I, I can't help but agree. And let's see. Yeah, the thing I was most worried about for the show was that it would have a repetitive plot structure like get a case, work case, solve case, end credits, next episode... And, yeah, I'm really glad that they went with this more personal-based kind of, you know, like Jessica wishes that she could just work a case and then move on. But the show is more interested in the personal, and, yeah, I definitely think that was the, the right choice. The thing I was most looking forward to was the noir touch. And, ultimately, for sure, there are times where that doesn't... It's not as emphasized as you might hope. And certainly, the like, the, you know, try not to judge one of these shows based on the intro sequence. Because the intro sequence, you know, had a lot of, had a lot of attention put to just those, you know, what, two minutes. And that looks amazing and really gives you a strong idea of what the, the rest of the show is. You know, the rest of the show is not necessarily going to live up to that all the time. But yeah, all three seasons are excellent. Um, all of the season openers, finales, and overall seasons are all great. Not not quite equally, but I will get into... I, at the end of the review, I will rank all of the Marvel Netflix shows. The trailers do give at least a little bit too much away, but also gives you a good idea of what the season is like. So it's difficult to... yeah. The cover and poster do not give too much away. Now, the... Let's, oh, right, yeah. The So, on Rotten Tomatoes, Season 1 has a 94%, which makes it certified fresh, and 85% from users. Season 2 has an 82% and 67% from users and season three only has a 73 percent that's the only of the three seasons that is not um certified fresh it is fresh but not certified and 75 for yeah um so yeah the you know people didn't love all three seasons equally but all three seasons were largely positively received on metacritic it has a 76 out of 100 based on 58 critic reviews. And I am just going to very briefly... Yeah, so 47 of them are positive. Only 11 are mixed and 0 are negative. And the user score is 6.9 based on 119 ratings. 85 of which are positive. 11 are mixed and 23 are negative. And, yeah, um, there's only two negative user reviews. One of them is in French, the other is in English, and they just say very unlikable main character. So, uh, there's only one mixed review. It's in German, so I cannot tell you what it says. And the rest of the reviews are positive. And, right, I forget if I said, but yeah, 6.9 out of 10 is the overall rating. And that's for the entire show. Uh, Metacritic doesn't really do individual seasons, which can make that a little bit more difficult to work with. Now, that brings us to IMDb. 
where it has 688 user reviews or 478 if you, without spoilers. Uh, there are 149 links in the IMDb external reviews section and 68 of them are in English and not dead links. And yeah, it has a 7.9 out of 10, which that's quite good, especially for something so feminist and something so like, yeah, you know, this it's uh, like... I, as a man watching this, I, you know, I am confronted with some of the awful things that, you know, people from my gender sometimes do. Uh, you know, I'm okay with that. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've come to realize how much worse women have it in a lot of ways because of patriarchy. But a lot of people are not willing to. So, yeah, 7.9, that really does tell you that it is excellent. You know, there's a lot of great progressive media, but a lot of it is not positively received because of, yeah, politics. And, yeah, there are a lot of conservatives who refuse to entertain the progressive. You know, I, th I think progressives are more willing to listen to conservatives than conservatives are there's there's a lot of conservative movies that i would acknowledge okay that's at least well made uh, you know off the top of my head the first conan movie the rambo movies except maybe the third one that one and i mean it, it definitely has some strengths as well uh, you know the the diehard movies other than five and probably also four i think i i liked it fine when i watched it first but if i watched it again today i'd probably be like wow that was none but yeah you know fiercely conservative but they're fairly well made and let's see right so 212,557 imdb users have given a weighted average vote of 7.9 out of 10 so 29.7% gave it 8, 21.4 gave it 7, 17.6 gave it 10, 17.3 gave it 7, 6.7 gave it 6, let's see, 2.8 gave it 5, 1.8 gave it 1. Yeah, I gotta say, if that's not politics, I don't know. I don't know how you could watch this and be like, no, there's nothing here that's... Four, uh, one point three percent gave it four, zero point eight percent gave it three, zero point six gave it two. Now this was nominated for twenty three awards and won twelve. So let's see it. Right, yeah, it. Um, the main title theme music won. That makes a lot of sense. And let's see what else won. Best teaser TV spot. Yeah, as also um, also makes a lot of sense. And let's see. Yeah, Kilgrave for the best villain. And let's see what else. Yeah, best costume hair makeup design team. Also really great. Um I think that might be what... And Kristen Ritter won a Webby for Best Actress. Yeah. So that brings us to... Yeah, so right now there are... I'm just going to double check, so... Let me take a few seconds. Right now... There are no special features on Disney Plus for this, but it does have all three seasons, and in general, it has all of Marvel Net Netflix. So, if you decide that you want to try to watch these, all of them are in the one place. You don't need more than one streaming service for it. And, you know, if you like the MCU, Disney Plus has got your back. Everything MCU, 
you know, the, yeah, I think is maybe still some of the Spider-Man stuff because of rights issues with Sony. But other than that, all of it's there, and there are some incredible special features for a lot of the MCU stuff. So, um, yes, my rating is nine explorations of trauma out of ten. And, yeah, um, so, I'm going to rank every single, from, yeah, from worst to best, every single Marvel Netflix season. And the only one I, I, I love all other than Iron Fist Season 1. So, Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, The Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Punisher Season 2, Iron Fist Season 2, Daredevil Season 3, Luke Cage Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 3, Jessica Jones Season 2, and Jessica Jones Season 1. And, yeah. So, let me know in the comments, what was your favorite marvel netflix show and why if you could only choose one of the major characters doesn't have to be a main character but if you if you had to choose one major character from any of the marvel netflix shows but you would only choose one for the mcu to make canon which would it be and what do you hope to see from them let me know if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video, since instead of separate videos, since its running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog. So what's catch me next week? Yeah, by now I have I've done videos on everything Marvel Netflix. And yeah, now that I'm done, next up is the animated Star Wars shows. The the ones of them that appear to be like, you know, it's been it's now clear to me, okay, Ahsoka Tano, she's going to continue to be a big deal. Okay, fine. I will watch Star Wars, Star of the Clone Wars Wars, as one fellow YouTuber cleverly put it. If you, you know, if you look at the title card. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.